Hey brethren, today we're going to be reading in the Great Leaders of the Christian Church about a very famous preacher, Jonathan Edwards. Here's a picture of him. And he's probably known best for his um, sermon on um, Sinners in the Hand of an Angry God. But here's New Park Street Church um, in Boston, USA. And here's the um, Yale College, Connecticut. He graduated from, graduated from it in, in 1720. And um, that's it. So let's go ahead and get right into reading about, um, about him. He lived from 1703 to 1758. Jonathan Edwards is a key figure in the intellectual history of New England and of American theology. A person of precocious intelligence and a major Calvinist theologian and philosopher, he was converted when he was 17. From the time when he became a pastor of the church at Northampton, Massachusetts, until his untimely death from the after-effects of a small pox injection, he played a dominant role in leading and guiding the Great Awakening that went from 1735 to 1736 and 1740 to 1744, and in defending historic Calvinism against the attacks of Deists and Arminians, often by using their own intellectual weapons against them. During his ministry at Northampton, Edwards pub published a large number of sermons and works of practical piety, most notably the religious affections, he wrote in 1746. Following disagreements with the church over, among other issues, the terms of communions, Elder, I mean, Edwards held that the Lord's Supper was not a converting ordinance and that only professing Christians should attend. He became a missionary to the Indians at Stockbridge, Massachusetts, in 1750. It was there that he published The Freedom of the Will. In 1757, he argued, I mean, he agreed, somewhat reluctantly, to, the, to be appointed as president of the College of New Jersey, hoping to find time to write what was to, to ha have been his magnum opus, the history of redemption. But it was not to be. He died in 1758 at the age of 55. Jonathan Edwards is important not only for his pastoral insight, personal saintliness, and commanding intellect. He is one of only very few in the history of the church who seems to have granted an almost perfect integration of the heart and head in his writings. His writings in expounding and defending the evangelical and reformed faith are of lasting value to the Christian church. Jonathan Edwards, New England Theologian by Palm Hel Paul Helm. Influence on Edwards. The American histor historian Perry Miller says justly of Jonathan Edwards that he is the greatest, quote, the greatest philosopher theologian yet to, to grace the American scene, end quote. Edwards was born into a prominent New England Puritan family in, the seven, in 1703 and, despite considerable intellectual isolation, showed astonishing early maturity both in making scientific observation and philosophical speculations. Notes on the Mind Some of those show a close affinity to, out, to the outlook of the British idealist philosopher George Berkeley, who lived from 1685 to 1753, who though he lived briefly in Rhode Island, never met or influenced Edwards. Strictly speaking, quote, strictly speaking, there is no proper, proper, proper substance but God himself. It is probable that the similarity is particularly because both Berkeley and Edwards had a common philosophical starting point, the philosophy of John Locke. Locke's writings, Edwards says, gave him more pleasure than, quote, than the most greedy miser finds, when gathering up handfuls of silver and gold from the newly from some newly discovered treasure, end quote. The lock remained a lifelong influence on Edwards. His importance is marginal in comparison with that of the Bible and of the Reformed and Puritan theologians whose writings Edwards grew up with. Quote, However, the term Calvinist is in in these days among most a term of greater reproach than the term Arminian. 
Yet for distinction's sake, though I utterly disclaim a dependence on Calvin, or a belief in the doctrines which I hold, because I because he believed and taught them. Many of Edward's more practical writings about um abound with approving quotations from John Flavel, Thomas Manton, John Owen, Theophilus Gale, and Sam and Samuel Rutherford. And Jonathan Edwards said of the Reformed theologian um, Van Maastricht that his writings were better than quote than any other book in the world, excepting the Bible. In my excepting the Bible, in my opinion. Conversion. After being educated at home, he entered the Collegiate School of Connecticut, which afterwards became Yale College in sixteen seven six in seventeen sixteen, graduating in seventeen twenty. It is around this time that he was converted, remarking that as he read First Timothy one seventeen, quote, there came into my soul, and it was as it were diffused through it, a sense of glory of the divine being, a new sense, quite different from anything I had ever experienced before. From about that time, I began to have a new kind of apprehension and ideas of Christ, and the works of redemption, and the glorious way of salvation by Him. End quote. From this time until his death, Edwards devoted him his considerable powers to proclaiming and defending the gospel whose power he had experienced, um, the gospel of his Puritan and Calvinistic forebears. After two years' further study of divinity and a short period as a supply minister in New York, he became a tutor at Yale in 1724, and two years later he became a minister of the gospel at Northampton first assist assisting then in 1729, succeeding his grandfather, Solomon Stoddard, to the pastorate. Under his powerful preaching, born out of personal sense of sin as an affront to the sovereign majesty of God in the need of divine grace through Christ, the church at Northampton and other churches wider afield in New England were visited with revival from 1735, quote, the work of God, as Edward called it. And several notable sermons, such as God Glorified in Man's Dependence and Sinners in the Hand of an Angry God, Edwards stressed that sinners are immediately dependent on God for His grace. In the wake of the excesses of disappointments of the revival, Edwards employed his analytical powers as well as his spiritual discernment to distinguish between the spurious and, bene and the beneficial lasting effects of revival. A series of important writings, Narratives of Surprising Conversions in 1737, dist Distinguishing Marks of a Work of the Spirit of God, 1741, Thoughts on Revival, 1742, culminated in The Religious Affections, 1746. Edward's characteristic method, drawing on the wealth of Puritan exper experiential divinity which, with which he was familiar, was to distinguish accidental from essential features of religious experience and to characterize true experience in terms of character and, and fruit. And then in the diary of the missionary David Brainerd, um, 1780, 18 to 1747, which Edward pub published in 1749, after Brainerd's early death, Brainerd was to have married one of Edward's daughters, Edwards believed he had found an ideal case study exhibiting precisely those features of true religion that he had highlighted in the religious affections. The Halfway Covenant Edwards' pastorate in Northampton ended in 1750, following a prolonged controversy over the qualifications for the communion. During the pastorate of his grandfather, the church had adopted the halfway covenant position, the view that those who attend communion, who, through bap though baptized, had made no personal confession of faith. The Lord's Supper came to be regarded as a, quote, converting ordinance. Edwards attempted to return, uh, Edward attempted to return to the original congregational position, according to which the church was composed of only two, those who were, quote, visible saints. For Edward saw the halfway covenant as a device for dulling the sinner's awareness of his need of God's sovereign mercy at once. Quote, to profess the covenant of grace is to profess it not as a spectator, but as one immediately concerned in the affair, as a party in the covenant professed. 
Edwards, Edwards' sermons do not accord with the customary ideal, idea of, the, of revival preaching. He did not rant. The sermons were carefully written out, reasoned, doctrinal statements based upon solid biblical exegesis and with a characteristic Puritan application to conscience and practice. By all accounts, Edwards delivered them in a dry, matter-of-fact monotone. Many of them came out from the substance of his books, for example, Charity and Its Fruits, an exposition of 1 Corinthians 3, posthumously published in 1852. If in his preaching and church discipline, Edwards strove to preserve the if awareness of man's immediate dependence on God for salvation also, and also to guard it against phys- physiological excess, he also wished to safeguard his immediacy from attack from another quarter, the rationalizing theology of the Arminians and of the Deists. In Edwards' judgment, both of these movements had a common, deadly effect, that of distancing God from human affairs in general and from the application of salvation in particular. For Arminianism made the reception of divine grace to depend op- upon an allegedly divine grace to depend on the free choice of the human will, turning a gospel of grace into moralism. And deism had a similar effect, claiming that the laws of nature have, ha- have an inherent power or necessity. According to deism, having set the globes in motion, God retreats into the shadows. It was wholly char- characteristic of Edwards that he was prepared to use philosophical argument and not to establish biblical doctrine, Edwards trusted the authority of scripture for that, but to show the reason- reasonableness of that doctrine and to rebut philosophical objections to it. He had a confidence in the powers of human reason, which was more characteristic of the 18th century than of his Puritan forebears, as he greatly revered them. The liberalizing, I mean, the liberalizing and rationalizing theologians found an opponent armed with weapons they were used, um, used, um, they were used to weed, used to wielding themselves. The freedom of the will. Despite the considerable duties and distractions in his work among the Indians at the frontier post of Stockbridge, where he settled in 1750, Edwards found time to begin his assault on Arminianism. Arminianism. His most famous book, The Freedom of the Will, was the fruit of the years of sustained theological and philosophical reflection, to which, a vol- to which his voluminous notebooks, many of them still unpublished, bear his testimony. In the book, Edwards uses argument of unsurpassed, relentless power, the result of his ability to reason things out for himself, to show the logical incoherence of the idea that men have the free will, um, the power to choose indifferently between alternatives. If men really have the metaphysical power to choose or refuse Christ, as they please, then they are able to hold God at a distance, to make him await their pleasure. Quote, the Arminian doctrine concerning habits of virtue being only custom, discipline, and gradual culture joined with the other doctrine that the obtaining of these habits and those, pa- um, and those that have time for it is in every man's power, according to their doctrine of the freedom of the will, tends exceedingly to cherish presumption in sinners while in health and vigor, and sends them to their utter despair and insensible approaches of death by sickness or old age, end quote. Rather, quote, the power and grace and operation of the Holy Spirit in or towards the conversion of the sinner is immediate and not mediated by the concurring action of the will, end quote. But Edders, Edwards was not a fatalist. Men are accountable to God because, though they are naturally able to do what is good, that is, to have... They have the necessary physical and physiological, um, no, psychological powers, however. They are morally unable, that is, they cannot bring themselves to do what is good because of their inherently depraved natu- nature. Original Sin On occasion, Edwards carried his philosophical defense of orthodox Calvinism, Calvinism to extremes. In his Great Christian Doctrine of Original fin, def- Sin Defended, also written at Stockbridge and published post, posthumously um, in 1785, 1758, 
Edward argues that the imputation of Adam's sin to his posterity is not improper. For, he argues that, quote, God does, by his immediate power, uphold every created substance and being will be manifest if we consider that their present existence is a dependent existence, and therefore is an effect and must have some cause. And the cause must be one of these two, either the antecedent existence of the same substance, or else the power of the Creator. End quote. He argues that it cannot be the antecedent existence of anything, because what is past has ceased to be, and hence cannot be the cause of anything. Quote, Therefore the existence of created substances in each successive moment must be the effect of the immediate agency, will, and power of God. God's arrangement between Adam and his posterity was no less natural than the idea of a continuous personal identity, since the persistence of a person through time is in reality of moment-by-moment new creation of God of a serious of a series of momentary individuals. Once more, Edwards insists on the immediacy of the divine control. Yet it is hard to see how Edwards' doctrine of continuous creation is consistent either with his own causal determinism defended in the freedom of the will or the facts of self-consciousness. Despite the implausibility of, the, of this view, it was con- of conspir- considerable importance for Edwards. He was the intellectual and theologian of New England Calvinism and of the Great Awakening. Truth revealed in abstruse reflection of the metaphysics of personal identity, the immediate dependence of the soul of God, was the same truth propounded in in some of his famous words in Sinners in the Hand of an Angry God. Quote, The observation from the words that I would now insist upon is this. There is nothing that keeps wicked men at any one moment out of hell, but the mere pleasure of God. I mean his sovereign pleasure, his arbitrary will, restrained by no obligation, hindered by no manner of difficulty, any more than if nothing else, um, 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 any more than, the, um, if nothing else but God's mere will, had in the least degree, or in any respect whatsoever, any hand in the preservation of wicked man one more moment. Edwards thought, whether expressed in the reason, uh, reasoning of a treatise or the measured language of the pulpit, was all, all of a piece. Princeton. The seven years of exile in Stockbridge, which proved to be a period of great theological fruitfulness, were brought to an end in 1757 when Edwards received an invitation to become president of the College of New Jersey. Edwards was not attracted. Quote, I have already published something on one of the main points in dispute between the Arminians and Calvinists, and I have it in view, God willing, as I have already signified to the public, in like manner to consider all other converted points. But he was persuaded. In January January 1758, he moved to Princeton, but died of smallpox on March 22nd. By his writings and personal example of saintliness, and his influence as a church leader, Jonathan Edwards, may be said to have exercised a threefold influence. His able defense of historic Calvinism held back the oncoming rationalization and romanticizing influence in New England, and to a lesser extent in the wider American theological sense. Scene. Edwards also came to be regarded as the inspiration of, the New, of New England theology. Theologians such as Jonathan Edwards, Jr., Joseph Bellamy, Samuel Hopkins, and Nathaniel Emmons adopted a, quote, governmental theory of the atonement and developed the characteristic anthropology according to which holiness is the choice of the greater good and moral character lies in the will. Regenerating grace brings moral power to do what a person has physical power to do but would never otherwise do. Much of this is taken from Edwards' distinction between natural and moral ability and inability, but but it is likely that the New England theologians systematized this distinction in a way that Edwards would not have wholly endorsed. 
This is particularly true of the Pelagianizing theology of N.W. Taylor, who, though came, claiming to be an Edwardsian, defended positions clearly contrary to those Edwards had devoted his life to maintaining. The Princeton Theologian It is an interesting note um, I mean, it is interesting to note that although Edwards became the president of the College of New Jersey shortly before his death, the theology of that college, um, of that college, what later to be co came to be called Princeton theolo theology, although becoming wholly in theo theological harmony with Edwards' Calvinism, looked for its philosophical and metaphysical underpinnings not to Edwards, but to the Scottish common sense philosophy of Thomas Reid. Brought to the New World by John Witherspoon. This held to a realistic rather than idealistic of the external world and to a view of personal identity that stressed its numerical unity throughout time. A second major influence exerted by Edwards was upon British evangel evangelical theology of his day. Edwards' long years of intellectual isolation were to some extent broken by a voluminous correspondence with a number of Scottish theologians, for example, John Erskine, who also sent him books. During the troubles with the church at Northampton, Edwards even expressed a willingness to em emigrate and to minister in the Church of Scotland. More important, Edwards' call to prayer for revival a humble attempt to promote explicit agreement and visible union of God's people in extraordinary pray for the re prayer for the revival of religion, written in 1749, was widely, widely circulated among evangelical ministers in the British Isles. Perhaps more significantly, it was Edward's freedom of the will that provided one of the, one of the means by which the, hype, the spell of hyper-Calvinism, which had hung over English particular Baptists, was broken. Andrew Fuller's The Gospel Worthy of All Acceptation, written in 1784, is heavily influenced by Edwards. It, it is out of that emancipated circle of Baptists that the William Carey was sent to India, the first modern Protestant missionary. Finally, Edward, Jonathan Edwards' writings have always exerted an influence upon those who have a value of a robust and penetrating, penetrating defense of the Reformed faith by an original and remarkable mind. And that's the end of this section on Jonathan Edwards. And I've listened to one of his sermons on the parable of the um, ten virgins, and it was good. <clears throat> but it did help me um, get it, but definitely has been an influence on many people because he's definitely influenced many modern Calvinistic theologians and I can get that immediately just by reading what he taught I can see that in many modern preachers of Calvinism and like R.C. Sproul and people like that but God bless you in Jesus name Amen <laughs>